2,000 years ago, people were drawn to a glow. A flame carried in the hearts of ordinary men and women, fueled by the Holy Spirit. They carried and demonstrated the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. Join us as we trek with them in Acts, letting their actions speak to us as we listen up and live out the same calling to make disciples of all nations, starting local and moving out. Life's a journey and we do it in community. I'm sure we've all felt a sort of desert island experience recently during these times of lockdown. So we want to reflect with others on their journey. So why don't you join me on Desert Island Reflections. If you're gonna go fast, go it alone. If you wanna go far, you gotta to go together. In this season where many are feeling like they're living a desert island experience. Disconnected! Let alone! I want to bring us closer together through stories. Although physically distant, our stories will bring us closer together and closer to God. Okay, joining me this week on Desert Island Reflections is Nicola Hill. Uh, everybody will know Alan Hill and Nicola Hill uh, from the church. Nicola has a fantastic sense of humor. I know that from chatting to her. Uh, she loves to work with her hands, many crafts and, and uh, pieces of art. Um, she says she doesn't really like structure. Uh, I suppose that's the creative side of her, unlike Alan who loves structure and buildings and construction. Uh, Nicola only recently became an Irish citizen. Nicola, welcome to Desert Island Reflections. Tell us just, wh why did we decide to do this here down by the lake? What's significant about the lake for you? Well, uh, I just love, uh, I just love this lake. Yeah. And I'm just delighted to have it on the doorstep. And so I have ha been swimming down here, I suppose, I don't know how many years, a long time yeah. really, about 10 years. And um, I have a swimming partner called Deidre. We have swum together mm -hmm. every, nearly every day over the summer. Is it therapy? Is it just fun? Is it? Well, definitely a reset yeah. because, you know, you can't think of anything else when you're <laughs> in a nice gold lake. Tell me, where did you grow up? Uh, in the UK. Yeah. Um, none of my family were in even vaguely God conscious or okay. like I would never have been baptized or christened yeah. or anything or ever brought to church uh -huh. by my parents anyway because okay. they were borderline atheists. Yeah, but I, I was always a little bit God conscious myself. What brought that around? Because if it wasn't modeled or talked about at home, at the time, I had started a teacher training course and had met a Christian girl there who actually led me to the Lord eventually. Right. And uh, she brought me to an Arthur Blessed meeting, an open okay. air Arthur Blessed meeting, you know, the guy that goes around with the yes. cross. That was a seed sown, really. Yeah. Um, I ended up, after doing various jobs, going uh, and applying for nursing, in which okay. I got. But it was only when I started the course that I realized that I'd actually become quite withdrawn and quite depressed. Okay. And I remember getting a postcard from this girl that was in college with me, this uh -huh. Christian girl. And I thought, well, she knows the answer. I knew it yeah. had to be something greater than myself. She was part of this really lively, small fellowship yeah. in a house, a higgledy-piggledy okay. house. It was full of the Holy Spirit, all speaking in tongues. And I was saved and baptized and spoke, speaking in tongues yeah. that weekend. But when I came back, it, it and nothing really, really changed. So I still felt this terrible kind of barren, barrenness and, yeah, and yeah. drought. And um, anyway, we ended up going on a holiday to the okay. west of Ireland, to Connemara, okay. in the middle of nowhere. And really, I felt exactly as the countryside was. Yeah. It was just completely barren. Yeah. And I just felt, it echoed really how yeah. I felt. I just really, that was, it was actually just in the room in one of the, ha in the house there, I just bowed the knee and asked the Lord to come yeah. and uh, to be my savior. Everything changed, yeah. it, literally in an instant. Beyond that, was it was it nurse back in a nursing college or? 
so the next thing was I was in doing my nursing training in the East End of London and this this girl put me in touch with a sister church in, in Kingston. They, it was there I met Alan's sister, Pearl, and her okay. husband, Richard, who's Nigerian. Okay. When I met them, I felt as if I'd always known them. So wow. it was yeah. it was that kind of relationship. Connection. Yeah, and then it was there that I met Alan, of course. Yeah. Um, they were all at a prayer meeting, and I knew Alan was there. Yeah. And I'd even said to the girl I was sharing a flat with, I said, I think you're going to meet my husband tonight. And Seriously? She thought I was totally wow. mad. You knew straight away. I did. Wow. Yeah. He was praying for a wife for a long time yeah. and had a house built and everything. And oh, then, wow. yeah, <laughs> no and pressure. No, all the cage and no bird. Yeah. And then he was sent off somewhere to Dublin to, yeah. to work. He was saying, Lord, you haven't forgotten me, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then his sister was over on a holiday and, and he just, she said, come over to England. Yeah. And actually, when he was coming over on the ferry, the Lord spoke to him and told him he'd meet his wow. wife. Yeah, we had a kind of a funny kind yeah. of encounter yeah. where I was asked to bring him to somebody's house because they were going to a wedding. And just before we got out of the car, when we met, when we got to the house, yeah. um, Alan said to me, I, I feel uh, the Lord is connecting us both in some way. Wow. And um, so we only had this kind of short distance Actually, I think we were actually walking up to the house when he said it. Yeah. So we did a kind of a U-turn. We went for a walk around the block. Yeah. And um, I had to go back to work. And um, he gave me a peck on the cheek. And I was thinking, yeah. what is happening? And yeah. anyway, so, wow. and then we were married a very short time after that. As you, as you reflect back then for, for other big decisions you got to make in life or even dealing with difficulties, do you find yourself looking back to that moment and saying, God connected us there. That was an act of God, you know. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. And that was always the the big thing for us yeah. uh, was that we knew that God had brought us together because yeah. God had kind of worked independently in both yeah, of our yeah. lives up yeah. until that point. So, and there was confirmation with other Christians, yeah, with yeah. Richard and Pearl, obviously, and with you know Gary and Eileen, yeah, and. Um, uh, another couple, Colin and Joyce Langren, yeah. they all confirmed kind of, you know, it wasn't just us kind of feeling, yeah, this is this yeah. is right. There was kind of confirmation with, yeah. with others. Like, how did you feel about having to move to Ireland? Well, I, I couldn't wait to get here, uh, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but um, I suppose I had no idea how different the culture was. I yeah. really had no idea. <laughs> uh, like, when the, on our first... Uh, evening coming back on our honeymoon yeah. um my sister-in-law said oh somebody might call to see you this evening uh so you know she had the fire lit and all the rest of it so it's so fine so about half past nine at night i thought oh they're not coming now i'm going to bed yeah so uh, ding dong the, the doorbell goes at 10 o'clock at night wow. and practically yeah. the whole of the the the, the country comes in the door <laughs> and I was so shocked yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I just couldn't believe that somebody would come up all of Alan's aunts and uncles yeah. uh, some of his her, his aunt and uncle brought an, a, a neighbour down with yeah. him she was crazy and she was doing a kind of dancing on the floor wow. and I thought oh my goodness like what yeah. has happened is this going to happen every <laughs> night like an like, induction like, ceremony yeah, or something was. yeah <laughs> To finish up, uh, generally, what has been your sort of lockdown learning? What if, what if, give us one, maybe one thing that you've learned through lockdown. And look, it can be, it doesn't always have to be a positive thing. It can be one of the negatives or... Um, I think probably I would say to be living in the present and to, to live one day at a time. Yeah. Make something of the day. Make, yeah. the use, make use of the time you have yeah. rather than letting every day just you know yeah. roll into the next yeah. day yeah. and what about then moving forward is there any encouragement going forward or anything that you're looking forward to coming back around again or getting a haircut <laughs> I have to do it myself <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah seeing my daughter and my granddaughter yeah. you know up north um, yeah you know that's been the biggest uh, loss in yeah. a sense now I know that people have had far greater losses yeah, than that yeah uh, Heidi had her first baby last yeah. August, and last time we saw her, she was about ten weeks old. So she's about nearly nearly eight months now, so nearly starting to change in yeah. between. Yeah, now, she's been great at keeping in touch, but yeah. I would miss just the just yeah. the, the contact with her and being yeah. able to hold her really. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. I, I suppose for us, the goal with these interviews and these these sort of catch ups with different people is. As a, a, a family, Mullingar Christian Fellowship, even though we're physically disconnected mm. at the minute, 
through our stories, they can bring us closer together yeah. and closer to God. So thank you yeah. so much for taking the time to share with us welcome. today. Welcome. And it's Thanks been such a blessing. Me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Thanks, Nicola. Simon. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Church Online. Uh, it's great to have uh, you with us. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, thanks to everyone who participated in the Easter celebrations. Uh, it was brilliant just to be together over the weekend and all the different events that were happening. Thank you for participating. Thank you for helping. I pray our prayer was that you would be encouraged by it and that together we would know uh, the presence of the risen Christ in our lives. I also wanted to say thanks to those who have been running uh, connect groups for us uh, over uh, February and March. Um, some of those will continue uh, throughout April. Uh, we'll pick up with a new season of connect groups in May and, and June. So we'll begin to promote those to you uh, toward the end of April. But if you have any ideas, whether that's a, a prayer walking group, uh, as the restrictions are eased or anything else, please don't be afraid to send that in to either Fiona or myself. Uh, we'd love to try and include as many people within the fellowship as possible in our connect groups. And if you're new to MCF, uh, we would encourage you to plug into a connect group as well. Uh, so if you need any advice or help on that, please get in touch with us both. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also say that regarding uh, the you know, restrictions beginning to lift going forward, we will continue to communicate with you about when potentially the church might be open again for worship um, and how that might function in Luke. So uh, again, just the email is probably our best form of, of communication at the moment, best way to connect with you. Um, so if you're not getting the email, please do let us know. Uh, but please do check the email out and read it uh, because it'll give you all the advice and information that you'll need going forward. Uh, let me just pray for us before we get in uh, to today's message. We're starting a new series. Uh, we're going to be uh, tracking with uh, the followers of Jesus through the book of Acts um, and witnessing how they moved as a, from a people of no hope to a people of no fear as they committed uh, to follow Christ and to uh, fulfill his mission, his kingdom mission here on the earth. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Um, and we'll see as the church began to grow and expand and how uh, these ordinary men and women were used by God in an extraordinary way. So let me pray for us just before we get into today's message. Father, I just thank you for your love for each of us. Um, I thank you for your presence at work in us. I thank you that even in some of these difficult times that we've been experience, experiencing over the last year, you have been present in it all. I thank you for uh, the way that you, you take ordinary people like us and you um, invite us into your mission. And you give us supernatural, extraordinary power that comes from the presence and work of the Holy Spirit in each of us. Father, help us not to limit you. Help us not to shy away from what you're calling us to. Help us to give our lives fully over to you in obedience, even when the task seems too great for us to do. Holy Spirit, we welcome you and we ask you to just guide our time together now in Jesus' name. We're just beginning a new series uh, in, we're gonna be looking through the book of Acts uh, throughout the next few months. Um, we're gonna be tracking with the followers of Christ uh, as they move from being a people of, in a sense, no hope to no fear um, after their encounter with the resurrected Christ. Um, and then we witness the Holy Spirit coming and, and them being scattered all across uh, the known world and the establishment and, and the growth of, of this community of faith, the, the church in a sense. And here's one key verse I want us to hold on to uh, just as we start into this. It's in Acts 4.13 because I think many of us can identify with this. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, they were ordinary men, they marveled and took note that these men had been with Jesus. What I love, they were unschooled. 
They were ordinary men, fishermen. But whenever people saw their actions, it was like their actions spoke. They marveled and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Listen, we have entitled this series, Actions Speak. We're going to be looking through the book of Acts together. And two things I would love us to do as we move through the book of Acts. The first is I would love us to be able to listen up. Let's listen to what God is saying to us afresh. Secondly, I want us to live it out. I want us to listen up. God, what are you saying to us? What are you saying to Mullingar Christian Fellowship Church? What are you saying to me personally? And I want us then to live it out, to go for it. So many of you will know that the Acts of the Apostles is what Acts is commonly known. It's the activity of the followers of Jesus after he ascended to heaven. It records all that they did, uh, basically their missionary journeys, the growth of their community, the spread of the gospel, all across, even as far as the Roman Empire. Luke, who was the author, he was a doctor. I presume his handwriting wasn't so good, but people could figure it out, I'm sure. Uh, he records everything as an eyewitness, and he does it to inform a friend called Theophilus. Um, it's less about prescriptions, you know, take two of these twice a day and you'll be sorted. It's more a description of what he witnessed. The kingdom advancing, uh, transforming lives and cities. We don't know much about Theophilus. His name means friend of God. We don't know whether he was a, might have been a wealthy relative of Caesar, uh, maybe someone influential, you know, um, Luke writes, oh, excellent Theophilus, so that we could assume that he was a person with a title. Uh, he may have been just a wealthy benefactor, a lawyer who was willing to support Paul in Rome. We, we just don't know. But what we do know from Luke's intentions is he was writing for a specific point. There was a why involved in his writing. Let's listen to what he says in Luke 1, 3 to 4. He says this, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke opens Acts with the same level of certainty. It's like the, the Luke's gospel runs straight into the book of Acts. And what I love here is we start with a confidence boost. Let me read it to you. We're in Acts 1, and we'll read the first three verses. It says this, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. There's a wonderful confidence for these followers. Jesus has showed up. He spent 40 days with them face to face speaking about the kingdom. They even ate together. Um, what I love is the promise keeper had kept his promises. He had fulfilled his claims and what he said he would do. He died and he rose again. You can hear Paul's confidence when he writes this, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living. They, they could qualify whether this was legit or not, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and at last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. That's Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15. What, what I love is everything is gone according to plan, is what he's saying. According to the scriptures, he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, he died for our sins. Their confidence then moves to obedience. 
as Jesus commands them to wait, not to go. Listen to what he says here in Acts 1 verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Before they do anything, they're encouraged to wait. I can imagine how frustrating this was for these eager men and women, having seen Christ, heard his kingdom vision, to wait rather than go. But waiting, albeit hard, is purposeful. They're, they're waiting for what has been promised, the Holy Spirit. In John's Gospel, chapter 16, John writes, It is for your benefit that I'm going away. This is what Jesus said. Unless I go away, the Holy Spirit or the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. It's to their benefit that he would go because the Holy Spirit would be sent. So why wait? This is the thing. God doesn't expect us to do anything alone. We're invited into his thing, not the other way around. I remember being involved in ministry early in life, uh, working with Youth for Christ, and, and I, I always felt I was doing the will of God. Um, but as I reflect back on it now, I think many times I was like doing what I wanted to do and asking God to come and bless it rather than the other way around, rather than um, taking time waiting to see what God was already doing and then joining him in that. Do you know, I think as we move forward as a church, and I know we're soon to be emerging from lockdown, I would love that we had this posture of, of waiting, not just rushing back into things perhaps as they were before, but actually waiting on God and saying, Lord, is, is, reveal to us what, what you're up to. Reveal to us what you're doing in Mullingar and help us, enable us to join you in that. They had a confidence in Jesus. Next, I would love us to see that they had a dependence on the Holy Spirit. Let's read chap, chapter one again, verses four to eight. It says this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now I can hear you all at home. I can hear you making fun of me the way I say power, okay? So power is another way of saying it. But if you're like me from the north of Ireland, par, I think there's a thing goes around about something about, would you jump into the par shar? So forgive me for my accent. I hope, I hope you can understand what I'm saying. But I want us to really see here that there's a dependence on the Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our strength. At least that's what Jesus was telling his followers basically saying you have limited resources and limited abilities, but the good news is you will receive power. The word in Greek is dunamis, where we get our word for dynamite from. This is like a sense of an explosive power, a miraculous power, a supernatural power. These men and women, they, they didn't have great programs. They, they didn't they weren't talented personalities. They, they didn't have extraordinary funding. But what they did have was a total dependency on the Holy Spirit. You see, their influence 
would come from God's generosity, not their abilities. Their influence would come from God's generosity, not their abilities. You see, to accomplish God's will and plan, our primary source of strength will come from the Holy Spirit. We're reminded of that in Ephesians 2 or Ephesians 3.20 where Paul writes this, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us, that's the Holy Spirit active within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think or another translation puts it as immeasurably more. Take this apple, for instance, right? You might see it as fruit. Some might see it as an apple. Some might see an apple tree. Some might even see an orchard. See, everyone who holds an apple carries an orchard in their hand if they know what they have. Alan Scott wrote that in his book, Scattered Servants. I wonder, do we realize, do we realize what we have within us? Ephesians 1.3 says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Or read it another way, because we are united with Christ, we have every spiritual blessing we need in order to achieve what God wants us to achieve. I wonder, do we realize it this morning? Or do we act on it? Remember, we read, our actions speak. These men and women had a confidence in Jesus. They had a dependency on the Holy Spirit. But they also had a destiny to fulfill. Let's read in verses 8 to 11, we read this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Because the Holy Spirit was coming and would come upon them, the natural reaction of that was to be witnesses. He says, you will be my witnesses. A state of being, not a state of doing. I always think, I I used to think about evangelism as as something we did on a Friday night, you know, as part of a program or something we did on a weekend trip somewhere. But actually what this is talking about is a life of witness. That as the spirit is active in us, the inworking, of the Holy Spirit leads to outworking. You will be my witnesses. It's a walking the talk, not a talking the walk. Jesus referred to the kingdom of heaven as seed a farmer sows. In Mark 4, 26, we read that. First a farmer gathers the seed and then he scatters it. In Acts, Jesus gathered his disciples. He instructed them. He modeled the kingdom to them. And then he scattered them throughout the world. Even persecution drove them further out, but to many more people. They were able to step into their destiny. You see, as we gather each Sunday to worship, to be encouraged, then we are to be scattered all across Mullingar and beyond. We carry the kingdom. We're kingdom carriers, working the fields God has placed us in whether that's the arts, whether it's education, whether it's health and social services, whether it's hospitality or tech, wherever you find yourself, we carry the good news and we demonstrate the good news. 
Like I said, we are soon to be emerging from lockdown. What about us as a community, as MCF? Is Mullingar better off because we're here? If we weren't here, would anyone notice? Are we fulfilling God's destiny for MCF here in Mullingar? So we've looked at a confidence in Jesus. We have looked at a dependency on the Holy Spirit. We've looked at a destiny to fulfill. Um, what about a distraction to avoid? Let's look at verses 6 and 11 just lastly. Verse 6 says this, So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, you at, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And verse 11, Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand there looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What I would say to us, when we look at these guys, they were eager. And they asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were assuming a traditional view that the Messiah would be an earthly conqueror, uh, that he would free the Israelites from Roman occupation and oppression. Jesus said, no, it's, it's none of your business. That's for the Father to know the times and the dates of when things will happen. Obviously, the kingdom was going to spread all across to the ends of the world. But relating to these times, it was none of their business. And I think that seems to be, that should be the same with us. Like we could spend lots of time focusing on end times or, or trying to make predictions or different stuff like that. But let's not be distracted with those things. Let's, let's focus on the mission. This is what John said. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on your guard and stay alert. Listen, there's no sense of passivity here. Uh, we don't sit back with our feet up in some sort of layover till we get to heaven. I feel in some ways that's what the guys were doing as they were staring up at the stars, at the heavens. Let's not be passive. Let's be proactive in God's mission, expecting his return. The message puts it like this, stay at your post and keep active. So wherever God has you, let's stay at our post and keep active. Like these followers of Christ, we too are part of extending Christ's kingdom here on earth. Let's place our confidence in Jesus. Let's be dependent wholeheartedly on the Holy Spirit. Let's recognize we, we've been called into this. We have a destiny to fulfill. And let's not get distracted with minor things and focus on the main thing. Listen, lastly, I would love us to be a church not just in the time, but for the time. Sharing life and sharing Jesus. Let's just pray as we finish this morning. Father, I just thank you for uh, your word to us. Thank you for this opportunity that we're going to have to just um, live almost through the book of Acts with these early followers recognizing that their confidence was in you, God. And our confidence today is in you, recognizing that they were dependent on the Holy Spirit. And Father, we just want to say that this morning too. We are, we are wholeheartedly dependent on you, Holy Spirit, for you to be our guide, for you to empower us to do the works that Jesus has called us to. Father, we recognize that we're not just in some sort of waiting room, waiting for heaven. Father, that we're actually, we've got a destiny to fulfill. You've given us work to do, Father, and we want to be proactive in that work. Father, help us not to be distracted. Help us to walk in step with you, keeping the main thing the main thing. Father, I pray for our MCF family that you would bless each of us 
Father, that we would know uh, the closeness of the Holy Spirit's presence uh, in these days. And Father, as we emerge from lockdown, help us not to run straight back into the way things were before without waiting on you, without taking time to spend time asking you about what is the new thing that you're maybe calling us to. And then when we figure out what that thing is, Father, help us to commit to it fully, like these early followers. Father, they didn't realize um, the sort of end result of what their commitment as a small group of followers would achieve. They were just ordinary men, as we heard at the start, unschooled, unqualified. And yet your spirit at work in them qualified them for every work. Give them the ability they needed and the power they needed. So we ask for that for us as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.